are a media management and production company. Something like a small-time Netflix, you're responsible for all of the local productions here in Sweden. Incidentally, you've gotten exclusivity to produce the long-awaited documentary of Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who most of you may know as a very famous Swedish footballer who's known to be one of the best in this generation and like an absolute legend. You're technically also producing his documentary, but from what I've read about him, it sounds like Zlatan will be directing his own documentary. So, you and your team work for months. You put out killer marketing campaigns. You get everyone excited, and everyone is talking about this. Now, the big day comes. You're at the edge of your seats with nervousness. Media is ready, popcorn is ready, and it's about to be 7 p.m. on the great release day. Three, two, one. Unfortunately, not three minutes pass before one of your servers crashes. And then another and another. And within seconds, many people around Sweden no longer have access to the documentary. And you and your team go into panic, scrambling to figure out where it went wrong. And you start to wonder, what happened? What did I do? This looks like maybe the server, or server was overloaded with people making requests for the video, but no, you planned for this. You tested for this. You anticipated over 10 million people requesting this video from the server at the same time. And it takes a few minutes to figure out what happened. No, this was not about 10 million requests from the server. This was something much, much bigger than that. This, ladies and gentlemen, was the unexpected, unfortunate problem of the progress bar. My name is Avital Tsubeli, and today we are going to speak about something you rarely think about, unless, of course, you're in the business of creating video players. Today we are going to discuss, about the, discuss the video progress bar, or the seek bar, which is that little line at the bottom of each video that you never pay notice to, except for when you want to move around, when you want to know how much time you have, how long the video is. Sometimes you even get to see like little screenshots of what part of the video is where. In all cases, the video seek bar reminds you where you are. We'll talk about the importance of, of having the seek bar, why keeping track of how far users came is important for you, your users, what it means for your API, and what kind of load it can have on your server. Most importantly, we are going to discuss how to solve this problem with a simple and very elegant solution so that things don't ever blow up again on your very big release day. So I'm going to imagine that you are going to assume that you are an avid TV watcher, or just a regular TV watcher, and it's 10 p.m. on a Tuesday night. You are watching a show that you've gotten really into recently. I mean, I know I have. <laughs> and um, your mom calls, so you pause the video. Now, since it's your mother, it's about an hour later till you get off the phone, and at this point, it's time for bed. The following night, you're ready to settle back in and continue where you left off. This time, you silent your phone, and uh, what you expect to see when you turn on your TV is this kind of homepage, reminding you how many episodes you've seen already and where you were before your mother called. Now, imagine that this didn't exist. You'd have to remember which episode you were on, then like fast forward to where you think you were. Maybe you accidentally saw a spoiler. Go back, watch like 30 seconds that you've already seen. I know it's hard to remember, but it used to be like this. <laughs> But uh, this unassuming piece of information that makes our modern life so convenient is called the video drop-off time, essentially where you dropped off. Now, as it turns out, this data is not only useful for TV viewers like you and me. Consider that you're the person or team who produced the content. Wouldn't you be interested to know that a bunch of users dropped off after the first few seconds of episode three? It might be disappointing to know that, but it tells you important information about that content in that part of the video. Maybe it means you need to create a teaser for episode four to really push it. Or maybe if you've got ads in your content, maybe don't put an ad there. 
But imagine, and this is what we're all here for, that you're not the producer, you're not the viewer, you're actually the video manager and distributor, responsible for hosting the video and getting the video places. Your users are going to want all of this information, so you're going to need to give it to them. You'll need to give them uh, you know, all sorts of analytics, insights, which videos are doing well, where people are getting bored, uh, what the average drop-off time for each video is, be it on, on mobile or on desktop or on tablet, within their application, in another application. You maybe want to give them really, really thorough breakdown on each second of the video and how many people are watching, something like this. So those first few seconds where you know, people started really suddenly, probably they scrolled ahead to see, like, is this video worth my time? But what's happening at that drop-off over there where it's going from 126 to 89 really quickly? Ah, that's actually where we told them what the video is about. And so at that point, they say, got it, I can go check my mail now. So this information is use, useful for your users because it tells them, hey, if you've got anything else important to say, don't put it after the title in those last few seconds because a bunch of people are not going to be watching it. And if you're wondering why there's so much confetti in my office a few weeks ago, I don't think I'm supposed to talk about it on stage, so find me after. But in the meantime, I think that we can all agree that video drop-off time is really important for all of us. So how is it done? Well, it's simple, really, right? The player essentially just needs to send messages to the server, letting it know that the user is still watching. Two seconds, four seconds, six seconds, where two seconds is like the standard time. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that sounds great for one video, but if there are a million people watching this video at the same time, you're essentially inundating the API with a bunch of really identical messages about the current watch time, bringing us to the big crash of Zlatan's release day. So how do we really do it? Well, how do we do it at Kaltura? I'm a developer advocate at Kaltura, which is an open source video platform solution that manages the entire video workflow from uploading to hosting, transcoding, playback, delivery, and of course, analytics. Uh, our out-of-the-box solutions include things like a private YouTube, which we call media space, some recording tools for classrooms, and, um, and we also offer all these capabilities directly from the API as a video platform, as a service, so we like to call it. And through the UI, the console, or through the API, you can get a bunch of really, really thorough analytics on each of those videos. Something that looks like this. And it tells you things like uh, what content is viewed the most, who's uploading the most content, where are people watching, when are people watching, and of course, video drop off. We too wanted to provide this information to our users without attacking the API with too many calls about this same thing. So what did we do? We created, instead of using this server, our regular server, and sending all of our messages to it, all these messages to it, we created an all new dedicated proxy server. This new server handles only one type of call, the user entry update call. To explain to you what that means, user entry is the service that describes the relationship between the user and the video entry, and the update is the action that tells the API that something has changed in that relationship. And so when a message like this comes in, it goes to the new server, and it looks like this. Hey, Avital's watching this video now. OK, cool, we recorded it. Hey, Avital's watched two seconds of this video now. OK, cool. Now what happens to that previous message? It's totally useless at this point. You can delete it. Hey, Avital's watched four seconds of this video, as you know. Totally useless. The four seconds goes into the cache. Two seconds gets deleted from the cache. Hey, Avital really likes this video. She's watched six seconds of it. Can delete the previous message. And I can go on and on and on, but you get it. It's kind of like when you're on a road trip with your kid and they keep asking you, like, hey, are we there yet? Hey, are we there yet? Hey, except for it's the opposite. And you're saying, hey, this is where we are. Hey, this is where we are two minutes, two and a half minutes, three minutes. Then what happens when I get bored? I stop watching. I close the application after three minutes, 
and that last message was sent, and then no messages were sent anymore. Well, what I didn't tell you was that when that last message came in, a countdown timer started from 30. And if a new message came in, the timer stopped and started over. But if 30 seconds pass and it gets to zero, that last message becomes permanent. That 196 is now ready to be added to the queue of messages that are ready to go to the server. And they're sent in increments of 10 messages at a time, again, not to overload the server. Now, this 10, 32, these are all completely configurable numbers, uh, which you can see in this code here of the project. This is the config of the project. It allows you to set the logger. It allows you to set which API to eventually send the messages to, how many messages you can send in a one-second time period, and, of course, which API call is going to be handled by this server, in this case, uh, user entry update, as we discussed, and it has a time to live of 30 seconds. Most importantly, you can also add ports or cores for each server, allowing you to scale out if you need to. And so I know what you're worried about now. What if, you know, one message, Avital's at six seconds, goes to core one, and then it continues from core two? But not to worry. The stickiness of this dedicated server is handled by a regular load balancer, which ensures that all of the same message goes to the same place. So, to summarize, we've got a new dedicated server. All messages that are updating about the information between the user entry, the user, the user and the entry go to that one dedicated server. A load balancer ensures that all of that same relationship messages go to the same place. Each time a message comes in, it, is, it replaces the previous message of its kind. And if it lives for 30 seconds, it gets added to a queue, which then goes to the server. These messages all go in increments of 10. And that is how we don't overload the server. Now, the cool thing about this whole project is that it's generic. You can access it yourself from our GitHub. You can change it yourself. You can do whatever you want with it. And it's very useful for situations where you're sending the same message over and over again to the server, but those old messages become useless when new messages come in, especially if you're in video distribution. Because I want you to imagine this. Eight million, three million people are watching the same video. That video is two minutes long, so let's say 120 seconds. You want to send updates every two seconds so that your users are, are never falling behind. You send messages every two seconds, which is 60 times per video or even 61, depending. Now, if you are sending every two seconds 120 messages, uh, 60 messages per 120 second video for 3 million people, that's 180 million calls to the API over a two minute span for the same video. And these messages are completely useless once the new ones come in. So, if all of your dreams do in fact come true and you become the, the, the production company that gets to produce or direct the documentary on Zlatan, remember this. Redundant, excessive pings to the API require a different dedicated server that handles collecting and aggregating all of those messages for that call and that call only. Because honestly, from what I've read about Zlatan, it doesn't sound like he would take very well to it if his documentary crashed within the first three minutes of showtime. Thank you.